models. Uh, at first, I did that, you know, uh, to be able to do some nonlinear statistics on uh, on hedge funds. A very practical uh, uh, questions on the on the extreme risk of hedge funds, and uh, then progressively it expanded. So now I have several PhD students who are trying to to anticipate crises, etc. So I'm going to talk about a bit about that, so go fast in the, in the method at the beginning and then focus a bit on the, on the portfolios that we build and their characteristics. Um, first, I mean, uh, my admiration to Georges and everybody for uh, being able to maintain the regularity of this talk through a country whose economy is everything but regular. <laughs> Stochastic. Stochastic. <laughs> yeah. Stochastic process with jumps, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, this polymodal method is some alternative to the classical multi-factor approach uh, for analyzing uh, the risk. So here we'll talk, the, the framework will be hedge funds. You'll see that at the end I apply it to other types of funds, but in general, it's any type of investment of which you want to understand the risk. And the philosophy is that uh, before measuring the risk, one should know where it comes from. And uh, if you don't know the source that is, what, with respect to your environment, uh, an investment is, is not an investment per se. An investment is a piece of, uh, is a portfolio that sits on assets that are in the real world. That real world is made of thousands of variables and it has its life, its dynamics, and that's what we want to understand. So it's not a portfolio or a group of, a small group of assets, uh, one respect to the other. It's all of those things sitting on thousands of legs that are sitting on the market, and the market is a very complex system as a whole. So that's what we want to understand. So when we do factor analysis, whether it is linear or nonlinear, the usual approach, and everybody is asking that, so what is your, it's a problem of conditional expectation. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we have some factors, n factors, and uh, we are trying to know upon some uh, uh, moves, of those uh, risk factors, whether they can, you know, yep. Yeah. Conditional expectation with respect to what probability? Here, the whole talk knows only about the P probability. Mm? <laughs> Forget about Q, that's something that does not exist in here. <laughs> it's all about the Q. <laughs> Q is a word, the, 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 that letter dropped, you know, in the alphabet, you know, go directly from P to R. <laughs> Um, so, um, so basically, and uh, the second thing that at this stage, I am not too much talking, I mean, I have ways of working on, on, the, on the processes, but at this stage, I'm essentially talking on one period, uh, random variables. Uh, without accumulating, and then we'll see, you know, the impact of that can have potentially. One of the reasons why I am uh, not too much talking of processes is that also, I mean, that's a bit related to your question about P and Q, is that uh, when you start having a nonlinear modeling, uh, then uh, the nonlinearity at one day and at, at one month are two different things. They involve different aspects. And uh, well, typically the nonlinearity in one month is a result of uh, dynamic trading, whereas the nonlinearity in one day uh, will accumulate and give a sensitivity at one month to the volatility, etc. So it's different sources. Uh, so we can talk about that, but it's not in that talk. <coughs> what I want to say is that yeah. So a priori, uh, we are trying here. It is yeah. We are trying to get, you know, given the value of those factors, so basically the value of my environment, and 
I assume that I restrict the knowledge of my investment, which is in here is a, this letter Y, to uh, the influence of those risk factors, X1, Xn, and some error, uh, epsilon, which supposedly should be independent from that, so that uh, I'm just getting you know, the, the condition expectation. If I were more careful, actually, I should talk about conditional distribution and not just conditional expectation. Mm -hmm. The how, uh, what is the, the uh, how the uncertainty on the given form reacts upon some scenarios in the market is also one of the key questions about risk. Uh, the definition of conditional distribution is less easy. Uh, when you have a density, you can define it, it's pretty clear, etc. But we're in conditions where uh, the, the range of things that can happen is pretty broad. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm a mathematician, I will ask those type of questions. You know, the, the quality of the fits versus results, convergence of the estimators, uh, relevance of the variables, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, if one elects to try to calibrate a nonlinear function, uh, the number, whether you do parametric or non-parametric, uh, the number of possibilities become extremely large, and it's very difficult to get a good function, especially if you have a large number of uh, variables. Mm -hmm. And in here, you find out that the difficulty we face is a mental difficulty. If I'm asking you uh, whether you're going to, I mean, what the weather, I mean, uh, this morning we went out of the hotel, question was what the weather this afternoon? Uncertainty, etc. Now, depending on the question is whether we take an umbrella because we plan to walk outside or something like this. Or we are planning a trip in, uh, by boat. Or we are planning a trip in the mountain. Or we are planning to take a car and we need to know whether we can uh, uh, drive because the tires are bald or something like that. Uh, it's a complete different question. So the impact of, that, uh, of that, that the answer to that question in terms of risk uh, uh, return, we are planning an event and the, we are planning the, the photo of the, the group photo, etc. The, the impact of uh, that question and how we, are, we shall answer that question, even if the question is the same question, will it rain or will it not rain? Simple thing like this. The way we are going to answer, the sensitivity to the probability, uh, you know, whether we should take care, you know, if, if there is a 5% probability that rains, and if it costs me nothing to take an umbrella, I take an umbrella. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's about the group photo, well, we may want to see whether everybody will be here tomorrow to make the group photo tomorrow, if there is. So sorry, that reminds me. We are going to try another group photo tomorrow, by the way, at 11.15. <laughs> you see? Thank you. Sorry? You can tell us whether the weather will be good or not. Yeah, well, but no, just what I wanted to say is that try, trying to answer uh, uh, a priori, what is the function f, what is the volatility of epsilon, before knowing what we are going to do with it, is already uh, putting the horse ahead of the cart. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know uh, how we are going to use it, and so the, the way, the, 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 the sensitivity, the focus that we should have, and the answer, so the type of precision, uh, will, be, uh, um, uh, will, will depend on what, what are we going to use uh, that for. So if I'm in practice, the questions become very different. Uh, what is the source of risk? If I have, you know, uh, one of the XI influences 
the variable y, I want to see, you know, what, are the, what is the risk that this variable xi uh, will suddenly have experienced a very big uh, move. Uh, I want to know what is the potential impact in that particular scenario. What is, uh, if that scenario occurs, what, how the other variables will react as well, etc. Hmm? How far can it go? How frequently? Excuse me, Rafael. Yeah. But in, in the beginning, you, you just asked about the, which is the probability for the rain, for example. And it doesn't matter with respect to the, we can say, utility function of the person you are speaking with. It's beyond the problem of utility. That's why I want to say. It's the practical problem is beyond the problem of utility because uh, you may be very sensitive, you may have a threshold sensitivity that depends on each variable and, uh, uh, and the, the, what you are going to do, uh, yeah, you could say it changes your utility, but the, the, in that case, how to say? In theory, you could, of course, you know, bring it back to some utility theory, and I'm not even sure, but it's, it's so much making, uh, looking at things from the wrong point of view. Let's take an, uh, an assessment. You're, you're planning a trip in the mountain. The question is how much snow will fall and you have, whether you have a risk of an avalanche. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is not you know, the temperature, etc. You have to focus on a very specific event, which is snow falling in what quantity up to what risk of avalanche. Uh, the same question about, you know, the, the, the another guy, you know, well, so you see that the, the type of information that you need is very particularized to one particular factor. And of course you could say, okay, I have my complex environment depending on thousands of variables and I could weight the, 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 the distribution of those things, but it's not just a utility on, uh, yeah, eventually it's a utility on your, on your particular impact on your portfolio, but um, I would say, you know, if you, you would have to have such a complicated mapping to, to, to bring that back to utility problem, whereas uh, the first question is which factor matters? That's my point. Hmm? Before, before asking, you know, it's which factor matters and then how it matters. And then you can talk about utility. Once you have simplified the problem to that, then you can talk about utility. Mm -hmm. So, um, especially, especially if you have a portfolio where the, the, the major problem becomes the diversification. You have different investments dep depending on different factors. And the question is whether, that's the last question, so the question is, is there a case, and what the probability of that case, where all of my investment will be destroyed and you know, how can I deal with those cases? Do I have hedges? Can I avoid them? Is there anything I can do, react, etc.? Uh, problem with multi-factor analysis. Uh, let me put them, you see, it, it, you, you have theory and then the, the practice is really, you know, once you get the theory, think of how people in practice implement the theory and what the impact, and what the type of error that you do. Mm -hmm. So the typical way people uh, implement factor analysis is linear regression. I'm sorry to say most of the people, they do linear regression. Mm -hmm. Why are you sorry? Because I'm sorry. I like being sorry, you know, in English, that's a word that people use all the time. There's nothing wrong with linear regression. Yeah. It's like the salt of life. Yeah, exactly. So here is. Nothing wrong with linear regression is the following. Uh, <laughs> so is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> Your pinch is a choir, my dear. <laughs> okay, so let's do a little test, which I suggest to everybody. It's very easy to do. Uh, take, well, with hedge funds, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Take a hedge fund, you have the uh, uh, time series, monthly uh, data. Then uh, you 
replicated on a certain number of risk factors. Uh, you can use, you know, some stock sectors, anything that's related to what the hedge fund is trading. Uh, I like hedge funds because, you know, they try to cancel the, 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 the beta, but on the wings, of course, they have some super reactions, so they are very nonlinear. So you, you try to replicate it with a certain number of, uh, of risk factors. There is a famous, I will talk to you about, there is a famous uh, Fong Yang CA seven factor risk factor model. Um, and so what you do is that every month, you take a certain period of time. I typically take three years, so 36 uh, uh, returns. Every month, I calibrate the, risk, the, 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 the coefficients of the, of, the, of the factors. Then you uh, apply those coefficients to the return over the next month. So you calibrate on the period like this. Then you apply it at the next month, just one month ahead. You don't do a big out of sample test, just one month out of sample, calibrated over the previous 36 months. So supposedly, if the phone has some sort of stability in its style, it should be okay. So you get now a prediction, which is applying whatever is, has been calibrating over this period to the return of the factors over the next month. And now you want to see whether this is a good prediction. A priori, the error should have a smaller variance than the initial fund. Otherwise, you could have simply taken zero as a, as a prediction, and it would have been a better thing. So you compute P2 is 1 minus the ratio of variance. If you do that in sample, that is called the R-square. If you do that out of sample, I call that the P-square. And P square, you find out that the prediction is most of the time purely imaginary because it's square, it's a negative number. <clears throat> if you think of it, and if you think that this has a variance that's comparable to that one, that means that in order for the P square to be positive, the angle between the two has to be at most uh, 60 degrees because you want the difference to have uh, uh, variance that's no more than the variance of the... Hmm? So it means a correlation of at least 50%. It doesn't mean a zero correlation. Hmm? Uh, you find out that as soon as you get some substantial nonlinearity, it's extremely difficult to achieve. And believe me, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, except when you have phones that are, you know, structurally uh, long, uh, on their investment, uh, you, I haven't seen, I mean, that, that's something, I mean, that, that kills any type of linear factor analysis uh, for a portfolio which, is, uh, which contains any long short. So any risk system that is based on this type of method, just forget about applying it on the long short portfolio, systematically. <clears throat> Uh, the second thing is that that particularly blows up when you have a change of regime by definition. Mm -hmm. And change of regime occur when you have, you know, the... the. So, in some sense, you want, if you want to, to understand what's a change of regime, a change of regime is, uh, you know, when the, 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 the bid has changed, it's typically an option that goes from out of the money to in the money, uh, which will make, uh, you know, a change in the reaction, the change in the risk factors. And you will see a lot of statistical models that take the time of the change of regime as a random variable. Uh, like, you know, you see uh, in credit models, you know, saying, okay, well, I have a Poisson process for the default process. It's really assuming that you are not reading the news, that you are not, you have no other information than the pure, you know, rain that's falling, etc. In here, we want to understand what triggers those change of regime. Are they predictable? In fact, of course, they are extremely predictable. Hmm? Conditionally predictable. Not just the fact that, you know, I'm not sure that tomorrow something will happen, but I know that any time I have a super drop of the market, yeah, and the, the old my betas will, will have to be recalculated because they, they differ. And that is exactly what we call nonlinearity. 
Mm? So we want to calculate those nonlinearities. Mm? Okay, I go fast on this one. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that optimizers tend to not to maximize this ratio, but to maximize this ratio. That is, you know, making the maximum of hidden risk versus measured risk because they try to minimize the hidden risk, the, the measured risk only. Um, so vanishing diversification, okay, I have a, a theory here precisely about those change of regime. Uh, suppose you have different regimes with different probabilities here. And you have a Markov process that uh, go from one regime to another. And so your principal regime is P1, that's a normal thing, but you have some extreme regimes here of different, different nature in here. Mm -hmm. uh, now suppose that as we showed uh, the, the, with this Y hat, uh, we hedge the, the major regime. Mm -hmm. So we get those lambda that correspond to P1, which is the, 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 the business as usual, 80% uh, or 90% probability regime. And the rest is just, you know, things that occur once in a while. So what happens is that if you hedge, you kill the, the, the risk in that category, but you haven't done anything and even maybe has increased the risk in those other categories. So in some sense, what happens is that you have created fat tails because you have reduced the major volatility, but you haven't reduced all the others. That's exactly actually what's happening today in the market. The VIX is very low, and the VIX being very low while extreme risk has, has no reason to have changed, even assuming that there is no more extreme risk than usual. So uh, we, just by the fact that you have a low uh, uh, um, business as usual volatility means we have fatter tails, mechanically. Hmm. So, uh, the, the, so the, just the fact that, you know, just observing that uh, if you try to reduce risk without taking into account all the possible regimes, then by reducing the risk, you increase the fat tail. The, exactly the same story as you see here. Hmm. Okay, uh, data world, you know, it's always this absurdity uh, of uh, people saying, okay, well, uh, on the one hand, I can't make statistics because I don't have enough data. And on the other hand, I have those computers crunching, you know, millions of data and I still have them running for hours and for nights. So, so there's uh, total incompatibility here. That means that you're not processing data in the correct way. Mm -hmm. In here, we have an extremely slow computer with lots of neurons but we managed to make decision in fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. So that means that something is wrong in the way we are dealing with data. Mm -hmm. And it's about that. This one, everybody knows it. <laughs> okay, so what the principle of polymodels? The principle of polymodels is do factor analysis, but Instead of first making a multi-factor analysis and then introducing other regimes, non-linearities, et cetera, that you know, will come as a second layer on the, the, the ground is already wrong. So you want to introduce first a non-linearity, which is something absolutely essential in risk analysis, then introduce a multi-factor problem. Why do we do so? What happens in crisis? Someone has seen crisis in his, li in his life? In this country, this country I know has never seen crisis. So I understand that you don't know what crisis means. It's still normal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what happens when you have crisis? Nobody knows what to do. But especially, you know what, if you're here, you know, all the correlation go through the roof. Mm -hmm. Everything becomes, you know, agitated in the same manner. And basically, uh, you know, the, the, if you look at the crowd in here, everybody's going his way, etc., her way. 
and if the alarm rail bell rings, everybody is rushing in the same direction to the, to the door. Mm -hmm. So you have suddenly, su suddenly you transform a random process into a dynamic process that's completely aligned. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the first effect of the crisis is aligning everybody, everything, meaning that, in fact, any one-factor model would work. Conditionally to being in a crisis, any one-factor model works. Mm -hmm. So the idea of polymodels is instead of having one model that describes and then trying to answer a number of questions out of that one particular model, no, do it the other way around. You have a book. Every single page in the book is a different model. And I want to understand my, uh, my phone with respect to the S&P on the one hand, with respect to the Euro stocks on the other hand, with respect to, risk to the such or such sector, with respect to the interest rates, with respect to the credit spread, with respect to the oil market, with respect to the FX, etc. Every single one, you pass the page, it's no longer here, and you only focus on one factor. So it's a sequence of one factor models. I go from using five to 10 factors to using, uh, risk data had about 200 factors. I'm now using up to 800 factors uh, because I'm not limited. Of course, when I look at one particular investment, I look at all those factors, I catch a lot of garbage. So I have to have uh, an assessment of how valid are those models. So of course, I, will, I first try to get this conditional expectation, but also I need to know whether that is big. In other words, I want to have so the, the, my tool in here will be the p-value. The p-value is the probability that whatever I calibrate, I would have uh, how, okay. I, I calibrate a function f1 with respect to factor x1. I get this error epsilon one. Epsilon one, let's say I just take the variance of epsilon one as a measure of goodness of fit. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, it's like taking the R square of that regression here. Um, what is the probability that I would have calibrated that F1 with a, an epsilon one that would have the observed variance that I measure if the two variables were completely independent? If it, in fact, in reality, Y and X1 were completely independent variable. So if Y and X1 are truly linked, there is a very low probability that I reach an epsilon that is that small. On the contrary, if epsilon is big, that means that you know, they, they, there is a certain probability that that just come as a chance. Mm -hmm. So the, my book contains on each page that function F1, which I can measure in the parametric or non-parametric manner, I prefer parametric. And, uh, the, and the, the, the p-value of the model. How I measure the p-value? I will give you different methods. You have to know that in practice to make that work and get you know, something that is meaningful, that is when you pass a phone that you know is trading fixed income, you want to have first the fixed income factors popping, popping up, the, the you know, things that are related. So, just to give you, it took me about, I don't know, a few months to get a good calibrator for the function and a good set of uh, uh, factors. It took me 10 years to get a good p-value. So the question of the p-value is way, way more difficult to evaluate, to make it fit the reality. Hmm? Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so th that book contained that. Now, ask me a question, uh, a market scenario where you know I want to see what will happen if I have suddenly a new crisis that occurs that is similar to what happened in 2008, where I knew each factor what they did. 
So now I have that following problem of uh, contract because each page will give me a prediction, but those predictions will contradict each other. So how do you come up to one thing? It's a GPS problem. You have a partial information with a lot of uncertainty coming from every single factor. The GPS problem, same thing. You get several satellites. You know at what distance you are from each satellite. And then you want to get a 3D location from several distances where you have just a one-dimensional distance. And on top of that, you have more than four of them. Technically, mathematically, you just would need four of them that would be sufficient. Uh, even three of them, actually, would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Uh, in practice, uh, you can have you know, up to 10 satellites uh, are available, and you just reduce uh, your uh, uncertainty uh, by the fact that you have many satellites, especially satellites that come from different angles, because satellites that come from very narrow angle will leave you with a certain uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So we have that second problem, given a scenario to choose, uh, sorry, to choose uh, which factors uh, we are going to select to answer that question. So now let me uh, go fast on that. So uh, why is it efficient? Suppose you get that beautiful phone. Uh, in here, uh, it's a simulated phone. I can tell you what it did. Uh, it's buying uh, the, the, uh, buying the, the uh, AAA bomb, 10 years duration and selling uh, a government bond, also 10 years duration. So essentially playing on the credit spread, on AAA credit spread. And that is during you know, the period between the two crises, that is between the, the, the tech bubble burst and the 2007, because that was on the, the, the crisis. And of course, what happens after 2007 is a big blow up. What I claim is that the risk that you see on that red portion was perfectly predictable in amplitude from the black portion, even though if you look at it, something like a 10 standard deviation stuff. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? <laughs> How can you do that? Here is the answer. This is a history of the AAA credit spread mapped to the phone. So I make a best fit out of one single factor. Of course, I, found, I know what the phone does. So in here, it was easy for me to find that particular risk factor that was doing it. But if you look at it, of course that drop here was bigger than the others, but it's practically the same order of magnitude. This one was actually almost equal to that one. Hmm? When so, you look at the spread between AAA and Treasury, yeah. what happens if you look at the historic spreads? That's here. This is the extrapolate history of the phone. Actually, the surprise was not the drop, the red drop. This one was in line with what happened. The surprise was on the contrary. It was a black rise. Never in the history of the spread did we see such a rise, which is about twice as big as what any, anything that occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. So this one was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just tempted to say back. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, I cannot predict it will go down. I'm just saying, as a risk manager, if I see the range of possibilities, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, yeah, the, the 20 standard deviation, in that case, it, it was not a surprise. It did, it did occur in the past. You said that in the past, there were three instances before June 10 drop. That's what it exactly. Yes, exactly. It's, no, it's just look back. It's, it's just, just the fact. That you just, yeah, I'm not answering the question what is going to happen. I'm, going to, I'm answering the question what is, a, what is my value at risk, essentially? What may potentially occur with which probability? So now, of course, what happens is that 
if you, so I'm going fast here, but what the idea is that in that particular form, you will scan several hundreds of factors, and then you will measure that p-value. In fact, I have a score which is minus log the p-value because the lower the p-value, the, the, the better you are. So the minus log will, on the contrary, will give you a score, which is the higher the score, the better the factor. Mm -hmm. And you will find out that this particular factor has an excellent fit with the phone return and will have a, actually a very high score. Mm -hmm. So when you scan, you will see other factors that have good scores, but this one is a topping score. And so, of course, you will extrapolate and see what happened with that particular guy. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is, like in plain English, that the language of um, Shakespeare, so you take all the factors, you do a regression to your price sensitivity of your fund, and then you shrug the factors, it's more like the worst case scenario, and then you take the top, the most sensitive factors, and then you... Thank you, Marco. This is exactly that slide. <laughs> So exactly, take a long history, several hundreds of factors, scan all the factors, and this is exactly you know, putting the net in the sea and trying to catch all the fish. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, of course you may miss something, but you know, the more factors you have, okay. Question, you're doing repeated tests, and therefore there is a probability that you get a spurious stuff. Two answers. First, yes, you do get spurious stuff, but the impact, because the idea is to try to not make, so the impact of those previous uh, results is not significant on your risk analysis. Second, I would say it's on the good side, it tends to be conservative. So at worst, you may reject an investment, whereas you should have done it. Happens. Mm -hmm. I miss the Bitcoin. My wife still telling me, oh, I told you to buy Bitcoins. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> it's not over yet. <laughs> it's not over yet, exactly. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, you, you see, I mean, the, the, the idea that for every single factor I get, you know, a range of uh, a distribution, then, that, but that distribution is based on extrapolating. It's like, you know, for every factor I compute the condition expectation, and then I backfill, so even if the fund didn't exist, I backfill the, the history of the fund, just a second, uh, uh, history of the fund over a very long period, typically, you know, uh, actually, it's interesting in, in, uh, in finance that the data stream appeared in 87, in January 87, a few months before the, the 87 uh, crisis. So we have a lot of factors that go back to 87. The second thing is all the price rate depending factors started in the history starting in 95. So we have a lot of things and you extrapolate and then you look at the empirical value at risk of that extrapolated history. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I think I have a problem with the max of the single factor stress bar and let me tell you why. Because suppose you have a, suppose your business is to, to sell insurance and then you, you use each, each spread or each industry or whatever mm -hmm. as your risk factor. Uh, as one of the risk factors, absolutely, yeah. So if you do your, your analysis correctly, you could maybe conclude that you're going to need 80% of face value because it's 20 percent recovery value in case of default. And you're saying that the stress bar is a maximum, it's just, it's just like corresponding to one default. What if you have a hedge fund that sold insurance on, say, 50 CDS? Why would you only assume that only one CDS would fall? Plus, it's going to be spread. If, if that's why you use that's why you use indices rather than single. Uh, that's not going to get you out of trouble because the index is just going to be. They're all of them. You know, you look at an index which is 100, 120. No, no. The fact that you 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 look eventually at the portfolio. So. So you, you look, I mean, the precisely, the, the whole stuff is that that particularly well captures uh, the, 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 the correlation in case of extreme scenario. Because you see, you know, you, you define a scenario and then you, go, you look at the, the behavior of every component of your portfolio upon that scenario. At the, you know, the, so, so you, you, essentially what you want to capture. 
Yeah. Okay. The index drops 10%, the result of spreads yeah. 18%. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but um, that is just going to tell you that you're going to get you know, the, worst, the worst stress. But if you're selling insurance on, on, the, on okay, so you're saying still it's 10% of your value. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, uh, in, he, in here, I mean, what, what, that, no, no, that, that, that goes to an interesting point. I mean, the, the no, 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 but the, the, that goes to an inter interesting point. In fact, in that type of approach, the most important is to get a precise calibration of the asymptotics. That is what we call the extreme betas. You have this function f, which, you, which I calibrate using uh, um, yeah, using a, a, a nonlinear but still par parametric, I use polynomials, etc. parametric uh, calibration. And then, because you are going to extrapolate the impact of past crises that are not in your calibration period, it's very important to get good, um, good uh, asymptotics uh, so, so a good calibration of the slope. Here's a problem. Oh, yeah. You short Bitcoin, you short Nvidia, you short Snap, right? Okay. So Bitcoin, you think it's going to drop 50 percent. Nvidia is going to drop 20. Mm -hmm. Snap is going to drop 50. Mm -hmm. You say that your bar is 50. And what's your bar? I will have different factors, and in that case, I believe that the, it's pretty likely, not it's pretty likely that uh, NVIDIA and SNAP will be both sensitive to the same risk factor, which will be some type of there, whereas the Bitcoin will be different, sensitive to another risk factor. And uh, the risk factor that will catch the Bitcoin and will define the risk of that particular portion of your portfolio will not, in, will not impact the two others. It's quite decorrelated. The, that's a tricky one. So, so I have to check the. the no, no. I'm a, it's a tricky one. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Uh, the the basically yeah the the but the 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 the, the efficacy of uh, of this method. That could be. I mean, I one of my students is exactly working on that question. <laughs> No, no, it's not. It's not. It's, I mean, the, the, the absolutely. I mean, the, the once you get, you know, the, the once you get those three, you can so instead of scanning uh, one-factor models, I'd rather scan several hundreds of one-factor models than several thousands of pair of two-factor model out of only a hundred factor one-factor models. I don't have enough with one. Add the worst case. But the worst drop from one no, no, they, 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 no, no, they, they, this is relevant. I'm not saying, I'm not discarding, I say this is relevant, it's uh, work for research. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, when I say it includes hidden risk in the sense that it captures none of your stuff, you know, which are, and I will show examples, you know, where you see from one calibration period, you see progressively rising some sensitivity, and you see actually the buildup of the p-value, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you try to, to get, you have a fuzzy character, at the beginning you don't see anything, and then you add pixels, and at some point you see something. Hmm? And it captures, you know, uh, extreme correlation. Uh, this tail concentration effect, uh, the essential consequence is that the, 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 the more you're in the crisis mode, the more precise is your prediction. In, the exact opposite as what you have with, uh, with the multi-factor model. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, I go fast in the relation. Well, the, the, actually, you can check that in the linear case, the relation between the coefficient of a multi-factor model and the coefficient of a collection of single-factor models is given by uh, inverting the covariance matrix of the, of, the, of the factors. So you get the exact same story of collinear factors, etc. So this is much more robust than that. Um, yeah, the, here you get the, the formula. Uh, OK, there is a little theorem for those who like theorems uh, saying, 
if you have some ellipticity conditions theorem that we proved with uh, Czerny, uh, the then from what I call the risk curves, that is from those conditional expectations, you can retrieve uh, a function of x1 and xn, which is in fact written as a sum of nonlinear function of individual factors, which is the solution to that equation, to that list of equations, so that means a consistent multi-factor uh, function with, that is consistent with given single factor functions uh, in terms of conditional expectation uh, and which minimizes the variance. So it's a, this is a solution to that list of uh, equations that has the smallest variance. Such a solution exists for any phi provided we have an ellipticity condition which is written here. That is, there is a constant C so that the variance of any combination like this cannot be lower than a constant times the sum of the individual variances. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting to notice, I have plenty of evidence why this condition in practice is not satisfied that you can build. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I go fast, I skip that. I show you the prediction that I have for, um, for uh, multi-factor modeling of plenty of hedge funds during the crisis. So you see that what these are, you know, my YT plus one, and these are my actual performance of the hedge funds. The pink are the funds of hedge funds, and the yellow are hedge fund indices, so also average of hedge fund returns. And you see that the fit is kind of okay on the upside, completely misses the risk on the left side. That is a prediction has a volatility which is a, a, a value that is much lower than the actual losses. If you use a, that polymodal analysis, I pass on, you know, every time you choose the best p-value factor, etc., then you get, to get a prediction that is completely aligned with 90% correlation. And that's a one finger, one factor analysis, just the best choice of, of, uh, of factor. Okay, but that's also prediction on yearly. Uh, so as a pension fund, you want to know where the market is going, how will you allocate in a, and that's, you know, the prediction of the, of the stock market of the S&P uh, using pure economic indicators. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we want to build portfolios. So we are missing another thing, which is the, uh, some expectation. And here I have a very good tool because I have a long-term distribution of my factor across, you know, whole economic cycle. I have a, this function F that makes transformation between factor returns and fund returns. And so I get a condition distribution of my fund. From each factor, I get a conditional uh, 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 distribution uh, um, which I can map. And that distribution will take into account, you know, the fact that the, the non-linearity is the fact that you are selling a put without saying, etc. So, um, okay, let me pass on that. And, uh, yeah, so I get this long-term alpha, which is the expectation of the, of those, of the, 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 um, of the, of the, the expectation of that distribution which is mapping my very long-term distribution regardless of whether currently we are in a bull or a bear market. And this is without any view because uh, like in the, you know, black determined method where people can input some views, that's without views. I am saying, okay, well, if I have no guess on any single factor, I will map my very long-term average. And here is how the fund should behave knowing that it has a certain non-linearity, non-linear reaction to, to that factor. For each factor, I get a different prediction. Uh, I here have quite a difficult problem of merging those functions because those predictions are linked to one another because the factors are everything but independent. But let's make a very rough approximation 
that we just merge those distributions with weights that correspond more or less to the score that I was talking about. Uh, we get this global distribution across all factors for every form. We get a level of risk, which I was give, talking about this stress bar. And therefore, we get some ratio, which is commensurate to a sharp ratio, except that it's much more uh, severe than a sharp ratio. Actually, the values are way, way lower, about 10 times lower. Uh, and now, suppose that I do that little game. I take a collection of hedge funds, and I uh, saw them every month in three categories. Those with negative sharp, meaning that I observed that they had a, a negative return over a given period. Those with uh, sharp between zero and one, not very good. And those with outstanding sharp above one. Well, what happens is that if you take the good ones, you don't beat the market. And my benchmark is taking all the funds with a risk-adjusted uh, investment. So if a fund is twice as volatile, I put half the money in it. So my benchmark is as black line. Of course, has a big drop during the 2008 crisis. The best ones will not do better, will not do better in terms of the drop, but they will miss the, 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 the catchback of the market. Uh, at variance, the worst ones, are those who, in fine, uh, give you the best prediction. If I use my method, here's what you get. So you really get a good sorting between uh, the fonts. Um, OK. If I do that, that's simply uh, using the, the long-term alpha, regardless of the risk, as a selector. Uh, here, so that's this company that I've done, you know, where I have uh, the same method applied to a portfolio of ETFs now. So there are uh, some uh, fixed income ETF, actually a short duration, like as a, as, a, as a safe haven when the market is agitated, and some equity invested ETFs. Uh, three versions, but you see that it goes through the crisis with uh, surprisingly a very good resistance. This is thanks to the fact that some of the ETFs are shorting the market, actually. So you have suddenly the, you, the, the system will invest in those. But it's especially seeking those who have a convex response to market, because when you have a convex response, when you extrapolate, then the extrapolation is good for you. Whereas if you have a concave response, that kills the stuff. So when you do that selection, you, you, you fly away from funds who have a concave profile, and you invest in those who have a convex profile. And that gives this type of result. If I uh, try to identify within that what comes from this, uh, the weighting between equity investment and fixed income investment, then that gives you, so here my benchmark is the purple line, which is an, an average of ETFs uh, that are uh, long the market. Uh, it's, uh, and so I have an average of ETFs that are long the market that more or less follow the SPY. Uh, and if I apply month after month without selecting in which particular ETF I want to invest, but I just uh, apply a level of investment that is dictated by how much the, this selection will like the equity market, I get the red line. So I'm kind of slightly beating the market, not much. Uh, yeah, if I... You should converge. Yeah, I'm converging. This is my, my uh, last slides. Uh, the, the, so the, 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 f and the, the green line you know, shows you how the, the, the choice of ETFs through that convexity uh, beats progressively uh, that, uh, that uh, red uh, benchmark. Uh, here is uh, using the same method for crisis prediction. So I have a collection of several hundreds of ETFs. And I look at how many factors are uh, every time significantly selected through the p-value as, uh, so I'm just looking at the number of factors as an indicator of how the market is correlated. 
And that is important because it catches all the nonlinearities. So the blue line is the number of selections on, oops, on the left-hand side. The gray line is the average level of score that you get across those factors. Uh, so this is for a range of uh, fund equity US. This is for fixed income. And you see you know, how it tends to react prior to the crisis. Um, in here as well, you see. Now, just to show you, if I do something very simple, I take this blue line as a, an indicator, and I look at how it has risen from its uh, one-year minimum uh, before. So I'm looking at the current value versus one-year minimum. If it's more than 20% above, uh, the, 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 the past one year minimum, I start, uh, uh, I, I, the, the investment declines uh, very strongly. And uh, so you get the SPY, so that is basically uh, mimicking the S&P in blue. And I just use that as an indicator. And you see that at every crisis, in fact, you minimize, and you see that the ratio, you know, is flat. Then the, the, you get the, the tech bubble burst and you, make, uh, you, you drop less, then you follow the market, then you get the subprime crisis, and then again you drop, and then etc. And then you get the Chinese stuff where you see that you don't see it, but you see that in here, you drop less than uh, the, the actual market, etc. So that's what I call you know, a good prices prediction where you catch on the market every time the market is experiencing a very strong uh, drop. So that's what I wanted to show you. I think, you know, again, my conclusion is uh, in here. Thank you very much.